Today, we are in Revelation again. This whole series we've called The Letter of Revealing Jesus because that's what Revelation does. That's the whole goal of this, this book of the Bible, this letter, is to reveal Jesus, not to scare us, not to uh, cover over or darken or obfuscate some future kind of thing, not to try to make us kind of quiver in our boots, none of those kinds of things. The whole goal of the book is to reveal Jesus. The author tells us right in the very beginning, this is what the book's about, revealing Jesus. And then Jesus comes to the author, oh, Siri. and Jesus comes to the author and tells him, uh, I want to reveal myself. And then there are a series of visions, a series of uh, prophetic visions that reveal more about the way of the world, more about who God is in His glory, in His power, in His might, and in His grace and in His love. And we've just seen this over and over and over again. And, and what we've been looking at through this series is, Revelation is not a chronological timeline of future events. It is, it is a series of windows into the world as it is now. Uh, and some historic events and some future events. Or some things like we saw last week, which was just a, a kind of a, a picture of, uh, a, a kind of zoomed out picture of the whole of creation from the time that Jesus rose to, like, ascended into heaven <clears throat> until the day that uh, we all stand before the throne and worship him. Uh, as if it's all kind of happening all at once. And in the different views to help us understand who Jesus is, understand who we are, understand what Jesus has done and what he's doing in the world. That's, that is what is going on. Today we're going to cover four chapters. So we're not going to read through those chapters. We've read everything so far. Here's your homework, is to go and read the chapters. But I wanted to go through the sermon before giving the homework. Ordinarily, it would be good to read the passage and then come today. It's keen to help you understand what it is that we're going to read and then get you to go home and read it. We've got seven trumpets today, two witnesses, a beast, and a couple million angelic warriors. Uh, you can bet that this is a hotly contested, highly debated passage of Scripture, these four chapters, which is kind of why we're putting it all into one because it's the, it's the, it's the seven trumpets. Uh, you may remember the seven trumpets from last week. Last week, we, we had this picture of the throne room of God. We saw uh, the seven seals being opened. Who, who is worthy, John was saying? Who is worthy to open the scrolls? Nobody is weeping, and then there's one like a lion lamb. Uh, the angel says, check it out. There's the lion. He looks. There's this lamb that looks slaughtered. The lamb goes and opens receives the scroll, opens the seals, and we saw these seals. Broken up into <clears throat> the first four seals, being the four horsemen of the revealing, and then uh, three more seals. Today we'll also see the seven trumpets being broken up, also into four, and then three woes. Um, you, you will be reminded as we're going through these seven trumpets of the seven seals, but not just the seven seals, You'll be reminded, perhaps, of the story of the Exodus. Perhaps you'll be reminded of some of the prophecies of Jeremiah. Possibly, if you have delved into the back part of the Old Testament, some of the visions of Zechariah will sound very familiar in the seven trumpets, and they're supposed to. Remember, Revelation, the, the letter of revealing Jesus, is a recapitulation of everything that's gone before. It's trying to make sense of everything that's gone before because it's written to a particular group of people who are alive in the day of its authorship, but it's also for all of us. And so with all that said, let's have a look at the seven trumpets. Again, like last week with the seven seals, there'll be six, six trumpets and then a break little interlude, little inter intermission, and then comes the final trumpet. Very similar to, to last week. Um, 
And again, these trumpets, they're not trying to show us chronological accounts of future events. They're windows into the reality of the way things are. You'll see things that remind you again of the, the plagues of Egypt. And you'll be like, oh man, this, this kind of sounds, it's a bit different, but it kind of echoes the plagues. <clears throat> and, and again, the, the, the prophecies or promises to Jeremiah to a, the people of God in exile. And you might think, oh man, this actually sounds very familiar. kind of echoes Jeremiah, um, prophecies to a people in exile. And then you might think again with Zechariah, oh, this sounds like those visions from Zechariah of people coming out of exile back into the city of God. And again, you might, that's supposed to do that. In fact, the, the first century readers of this letter would have had those things front of mind or at least coming to mind as they're reading through these trumpets. Uh, the context of God's people coming out of slavery, coming out of persecution, God's people in exile and the hope for a coming saviour, and then God's people coming out of exile into the city of God. Um, this is what, these are some of the things, not even exhaustively, just some of the things that would have been in front of mind as the trumpets uh, sound. Um, the trumpets, I believe, are calls to repentance. So if they're echoing the Exodus, for example, uh, where Moses, you know, come and said, let my people go. Uh, no, not going to let your people go. Well, here's a, here's a plague. Here's some judgment. Uh, they're, they're things that uh, seemed to progressively either get worse or at least compound in order to lead the people to change their minds. In Pharaoh's case, his heart was hardened and no repentance came. Today we'll see what is the goal for the people who suffer these seven trumpets. First trumpet, oh, this is from Revelation 8. First trumpet brings hail, fire and blood and a third of the earth, trees and grass burn up. You hear this third, one third, uh, repeated a bunch of times. One third means enough that it really hurts, but not a full, like not a devastating loss, not an entire loss. One third. Second one, a big fiery mountain is hurled into the sea, turning one third of the sea to blood, killing one third of sea life and one third of ships, interestingly. Thirdly, a star falls from heaven called Wormwood, uh, many bitterness. And one third of rivers and springs become bitter and people die from drinking the bitterness. So we see the, the salt water affected. Uh, we see um, sea life and ships affected. We see grass and trees burnt up. And now we see even the drinking water, the fresh water being affected. Fourth trumpet sounds. A third of the sun, moon, stars. And, a day, and the day was darkened. This is what it says in verse 13. I looked and heard an eagle flying overhead, crying out in a loud voice, Woe! Woe to those who live on the earth because of the remaining trumpet blasts that the three angels are about to sound. So remember, remember where these trumpets are? These aren't just trumpets uh, by themselves. These are seven angels in the throne room of God. Remember the throne room? Like the throne in the middle of 24 other thrones. And around the throne are the four living creatures, like these epic, wonderful creatures. And around the throne, 24 thrones with 24 elders who throw down their crowns and pick up instruments of worship to worship God. And around them are a whole host of angels. And then around them are the, all of the people of God in this great throne room. And in the middle of the throne room are... As the seventh seal is opened, there are seven great angels with seven trumpets. And another angel comes, and remember he uh, brings incense and the prayers of the saints, which go up to God. And as the incense burner empties, he takes fire from the altar, puts it into the incense burner, hurls it to earth. And this is, the seventh seal is now the seven trumpets from these seven angels. The fifth trumpet brings us to the first woe. An angel is given keys to the abyss, to the pit. And one called Destruction, that's his name, 
is loosed with terrifying demonic beasts to torment the whole earth and people have nothing left to lean on. No hope, no government, no army can save them, no, uh, no can, you know, hiding in rocks can't save them, nothing can save them. Not their strength, not their, con- not their connections, not their political power, not their money. They can't even buy death. They can't even die. They can't escape this judgment. The sixth horn, the sixth trumpet brings four horns, three plagues, and hundreds of millions of angels prepared for war, and a third of the human race is killed. So again, not all of the human race, but a massive amount of the human race. We've seen the earth, one third of the earth, uh, judged and significantly affected, destroyed essentially. Uh, sun and stars, even the daytime, a third affected. We've seen uh, the sea and uh, even the ships, a third affected. Drinking water, a third affected. Now see, all of, of all of humankind, uh, millions of angels prepared for war and a third of the human race is killed. And again, the people don't repent. Echoing these plagues in the Exodus account, in Egypt, in fact, Egypt is mentioned in this, in this chapter. We see hard hearts, and these judgments, these things that are supposed to remove every other idol, every other uh, foundation that we might build our lives upon, to help us repent and come back to God, still don't cause the people to repent. So we have six trumpets. Mean, we could spend a lot more time in these trumpets, um, but we really need to get through the sermon today. Uh, all, the one thing we'll say is uh, I am with the crowd that believes that these, again, are not to be taken as future events that are, that are coming upon us, but these are to be taken as uh, a window into the reality of the world today, much like the seals were last week. And interlude, in the interlude, we see a, another wonderful event happen. A massive angel straddling the earth and the sea. This is what it says of him. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over its head. So again, pictures of the throne room of God. His face was like the sun. His legs were like pillars of fire. And he held a little scroll opened in his hand. He put his right foot into the sea, on the sea, and is left on the land. Now, this view of the sea and the land will be uh, important to remember next week. So again, this is a letter to be read usually all in one kind of go, not just taken apart in little parts, which often leads to the misunderstandings that people have uh, developed out of Revelation over the last potentially 150 years, uh, prominently 150 years, I should say. Um, <clears throat> so remember the land and the sea for next week. It's very important. This angel's massive. So big, he is straddling the sea and the land, and the scroll in his hand looks little, looks tiny. It's an open scroll and it's in his hand. Uh, ordinarily, if you have an open scroll, you're kind of holding it like this, right? Like an uh, open scroll. Here, this open scroll fits into his hand. When the angel speaks, it's like a lion's roar. And as this lion roars, figuratively, Seven thunders thunder. And as the seven thunders speak, John gets out his pen, starts to write it down, and the angel comes to him and says, no, no, this isn't for writing down. This is just for you. Well, this isn't for people to know yet. And so we don't know what that's about, actually. We don't know what they said. Uh, he said that, um, he said, we don't know about that, but the seventh trumpet is coming. And this angel tells him, at the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God will be completed. So again, remember, over and over and over again, we see the significance of the number seven, meaning completion or the, the finish or the totality of something or the universality of something. So the sevenfold spirit is the perfect Holy Spirit of God. We see seven, often like seven years 
doesn't mean a literal seven-year period of time. It means when the time is completed. We'll see seven seals. There were seven seals. We saw seven kinds of people. We saw uh, seven representations of uh, parts of the earth last week in the seals, meaning all of creation, every kind of person. The scroll was totally, completely sealed. And in the middle of the sixth and the seventh trumpet, this angel, a voice tells John from heaven, says, uh, go and get the scroll. So John goes over to this massive, great angel. And the angel says, here's the scroll, eat it. Eat the scroll. He says, it'll be bitter in your stomach, but sweet on your lips. And in Revelation 10, verse 11, and they, and they said to me, you must prophesy again or against, depending on your, your version, about, uh, or again, about or against many people, nations, languages, and kings. What is a scroll? The scroll is the word of God. The scroll is the, the gospel or the truth of who Jesus is, who we are, and our desperate need for him. Which brings us to the next chapter and the interlude continues. We're still not back to the seventh trumpet yet. Uh, there's more interlude to come. John is given a measuring rod to measure the temple of God. Again, reminding the readers of Zechariah 2, where there's someone there measuring the temple of God. He's taught to measure the Gentile court, sorry, not to measure the Gentile court, because the nations will come and trample Jerusalem for 42 months. So remember 42 months? There's a lot of speculation about 42 months. Uh, the speculation has filled movie plots and books and many, many, many YouTube videos from predominantly uh, old American dudes, bald American dudes. Um, no offence to bald American dudes. Um, many sermons have been preached about 42 months. Many dispensationalists, uh, you know, charts with red string and newspaper articles have been filled with 42 months. Uh, but all missing the significance, I think, of the 42 months, which becomes more apparent when you keep reading. There are two witnesses prophetically calling the nations to repentance. And they do this work for 1,260 days, which just happens to be 42 months. If you, if you average out a month for 30 days, it just happens to be 42 months. Who are the witnesses? We know who the witnesses are because the vision tells us who the witnesses are. It's the lampstands. These witnesses are not two future individuals. The, these two witnesses are the church throughout the church age, so the last 2,000 years and until Jesus comes again. Prophetically, and by that I don't just mean Talking about the future, remember, prophetic is not just foretelling the future, it is forth telling truth. It is saying prophetically, repent. Stop leaning on those idols. Stop building a foundation on anything other than Jesus because, like we've seen already, every other foundation is going to be destroyed. There's no other foundation, there's no other hope but. We have a great hope because God loves us and has saved us in Jesus. This is the prophetic work of the church. It's not limited to just those very words, um, but it is centered on those words. The ones who stand before the Lord, the lampstands, the ones in the previous visions who worship God in His throne room. It's you and me. But the beast who came up from the abyss makes war with the church. The destroyer, the one called destruction, comes up and wages war against the church. And he kills them. And in this vision of the two dead witnesses, the nations gather and they have a party. They're like, yes. We've been saying... Um, 
again, that if you zoom out on any 50 or 100 year period of the last 2,000 years, even though we think, many, many people think, especially in the West, we are in this unique end times period in just our lifetime now. When we zoom out, we can see any Christian living in most of the geography of the world over the last 2,000 years could say the same things with earthquakes and famines and wars and persecution and Christians being brutalized and murdered. Most places in the world, most of history could say the same thing. But I think perhaps this is one of those things that is um, not uniquely true of us now, but is increasingly true of us now. I met with um, a pastor from Perth during the week, Stephen McAlpine's his name. We're talking, he was talking a lot about it just in the last couple of centuries, uh, Christians have gone from being, in our culture in the West, admired, bedrock of the community, those Christians, good on them, can trust those guys, to being kind of the butt of the, butt of the joke, but still included, like, oh, good on you, Ned, Ned Flanders style, kind of, you're a bit dorky, but you still do great stuff, like, so good on you, but, you know, you're still, you're still with us, but you, you're, real, you're real nerdy. To then being tolerated, like, okay, you can be a Christian, but do it over there in the privacy of your own home and definitely don't bother me with anything to do with Christianity. Uh, to now being seen as evil, even just in the last couple of weeks in our, in our country, having politicians, leaders of states calling things that we have held to be true for thousands of years and, and, and hold to be true from God himself as an abomination, as evil, as detestable, as unthinkable. And anybody who believes those things or holds those things to be true have no place in not just polite society, but in the leadership of uh, anything in culture. And so the nation's gloating, celebrating the demise of the church, uh, we're seeing that kind of progressively in real time in our time. Not uniquely in our time, mind you. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to say, so we are, this is the very last days because of these things happening. This has been happening all over the world for the last 2,000 years. We're starting to experience this very thing even now. This is where the significance of the 42 months comes in. 42 months uh, may remind you or, or in your version or maybe reminiscent of Old Testament prophecies of time, times and half a time where you'd expect time, so a year, and times two years and then you double it again, you have four times, that makes seven years. That's a completion, that's all of the time. But instead of time, times, and, and four times, we now have time, times, and half a time. Something's interrupted. We're not quite there yet. Or 42 months, 1,260 days is three and a half years, or it's halfway to seven. So I'm not trying to say that we're exactly halfway through. What I'm trying to say is that the significance of this is it's not over yet. We're not done. It's not the end. The decline, the demise, the destruction by the destroyer of the church is not the end. Revelation 11, 11. But after three and a half days, again, not, not the completion, it's not finished yet. After three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. Great fear fell on those who saw them. The call to heaven and earthquake decimates the city, kills 7,000, but... Some repent. It's three and a half years of witness. And the, the, again, the significance of the witness is the church is doing what it's called to do and still dies. Remember how in the previous, in the seals, where there's judgment, and, and even, in the, even if you read through the trumpets when the judgment comes, I said, don't, don't touch the one with the seal. Don't touch the people of God. And here we have the people of God slaughtered. How, how can this be? How can this be true? Uh, again, it's reminding us that our hope isn't in political power. 
Our hope isn't in our money. Our hope isn't in our connections. It's not in our health. It's not even in our life. But even if we lose our life, we are still held securely in the hand of the one who controls everything. Just as it looked like to the world, it looked like Jesus had failed when he went to the cross and died. And yet in God's plan for the world, that is the very thing that led to our salvation. For the two witnesses, for the church in the church age, suffering persecution, even as God is allowing all of the other judgments to come so to take away people's idols so they wouldn't build their foundation on anything other than him, uh, we die. The church dies. The people in our day today, this is not just a historic thing, people in our day today dying because they hold fast, they are faithful to the one who is faithful, and they're dying. People in the day of the writing of this letter were dying. And Jesus gives John this vision to help them understand, even though you are dying, even though you are being led to slaughter, even though you're being covered in oil and lit up like lamps on the way to the games, uh, this is not the end. This is not how the story ends. God is not finished yet. And the irony of the church is that it grows and spreads under persecution. We see this at AD 70, the destruction of the temple. We see the church scatter and it looks like running from an earthly perspective, but from God's perspective, it is one of the key events in the gospel promulgation throughout the entire world. Actually, part of the fulfill, fulfilling or the, the pursuit of the Great Commission actually comes out of great tribulation. See this, um, I've preached this before. Uh, you see, hundreds of years ago, the gospel get into China, start to take root in China. Then it gets, starts to get mixed up with the politics in China and then whoo, it disappears. Church in China, gone. Not a, not a monk left was basically the call on the way out. And it looked as if the church had died. No more witnesses. No more lampstand. But today, in China, the gospel is ablaze. God is doing an amazing work throughout a region where uh, the gospel had taken root and then vanished. And now God has breathed life back into it. Then at the end of chapter 11, uh, we read this. The seventh angel, the seventh angel with the seventh trumpet. Seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders who were seated before the throne, before God on their thrones, fell down and worshipped God saying, we give you thanks, Lord God the Almighty who was who is and who was, because you've taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, the saints, and to those who fear your name from small and great. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumbles and peals of thunder and earthquake and severe hail. So again, we have six unveilings or revealing, six judgments come, just like last week. Again, we have an intermission of breath, silence in heaven, anticipation for what's happening next. And then again, we see, just like the seventh seal brought God's, the, the symbols of God's throne to earth, similarly, the trumpet shows God's reign coming over the earth. Not that he wasn't reigning before, but the seventh, the, the completion, the fullness of his reign has come about. We see the same signs each time. Thunder, earthquake, rumblings, lightning, the kingdom of the world, 
has become the kingdom of Christ. His throne is on the earth and his throne reigns forever. And I know we've breezed through four chapters, but I want to read one more chapter. This is a chapter from Zechariah, Zechariah 2, to help us understand. Here's a people who've been in exile, who have been persecuted, who have been crushed, who look back to Jerusalem and see a temple in ruins, see a wall in ruins, see a city in ruins. But they have hope in God. And God gives Zechariah a vision, just like he's giving John a vision to a similar people, his people in a similar situation as exiles, although a royal people, under persecution, being brutalized and murdered, being distracted at the other end of the spectrum, and all the while hoping and longing for God to establish his kingdom on the earth. This is what God said hundreds of years earlier. I looked up. This is Zechariah. I saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, where are you going? He answered me to measure Jerusalem, to measure its width and length. Then the angel who was speaking with me went out. And another angel went out to meet him. And he said to him, run and tell this young man, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the number of people and animals in it. The declaration of the Lord, of Yahweh. I myself will be a wall of fire around it. And I will be the glory within it. So as we know, historically, the people of God do rebuild the wall around it. So he's talking about a future, future city where he lives with his people. Listen, listen, flee from the land of the north. This is Yahweh's declaration, for I have scattered you like the four winds of heaven. This is Yahweh's declaration. Listen, Zion, escape you who are living with daughter Babylon. For Yahweh of armies says this, in pursuit of his glory, he sent me against the nations plundering you, for whoever touches you touches the pupil of my eye. For look, I'm raising my hand against them and they will become plunder for their own servants. Then you will know that Yahweh of armies has sent me. So again, he's saying, don't put your hope and build your foundation in any other city. He says, flee those other cities, come to me. Come to me. Daughter Zion, shout for joy and be glad, for I'm coming to dwell among you. This is Yahweh's declaration. Many nations will join themselves to Yahweh on the day and become my people. Again, we see this last week when we saw people from every tribe, tongue, nation, ethnicity, skin color, all raising hands, all bowing down, all voices raised in worship of Yahweh. They'll become my people. I will dwell among you and you will know that Yahweh of armies has sent you. Yahweh will take possession of Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and he will once again choose Jerusalem. Let all humanity be silent before Yahweh for from his holy dwelling he has roused himself. And here we see in the seals, we see in the trumpets, we'll see soon in the bowls, we'll see soon with a massive battle, and we'll see Jerusalem again, all recapitulating, all bringing all of creation to its consummation. It's not the end, it's actually the beginning. God will live with his people and when we need walls, he will be like a fire around us. And all of the people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who have responded to the call to come, who have abandoned their idols, abandoned the other foundations, abandoned their other affections, or subsumed every affection under the great affection of God, will live with God forever. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful promise. Don't get spooked when you're reading through Revelation. This is a book written to people who were suffering to give them hope. And this is a letter written for everybody else that we would heed the warnings, turn away from or repent of putting our hope, putting our foundations upon other gods and idols. And we would run to the one who has saved us, who loves us, who is establishing a kingdom where he will reign with his people on the earth forever. And he invites us into his kingdom. Let us abandon every other foundation. Let us abandon every other idol. 
and let us submit every other affection to the great affection of God who has loved us, who has saved us and who calls us to repentance. When things get difficult, <clears throat> when we look out on the scope of the world and we see all of the things that we're seeing in Revelation today, again, how, many, how, many, how often do we have war and rumours of war and earthquakes and global pandemics all at the same time? It's exciting. Because as we look at Revelation, we're reminded that this is not just for some future time because we had all of those things 100 years ago. We had all those things 40 years ago, 45 years ago. All, all of it is to cause us to re repent and go back to God, to abandon all other hopes because there's no future in any other hopes. There's only future in this hope. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you again for giving us this great hope in Jesus. For not abandoning us in our sin, in our rebellion. For not leaving us to our own devices. That we don't have to try to fulfill, perfectly fulfill your law, which you can't do. But that you've saved us in Jesus. And Lord, as we look to um, the judgment um, that surrounds us, uh, the calls to repentance, as we look to the future kingdom to come and the kingdom you're already establishing in us. Lord, please help us. We need your spirit to help us. We need each other. Would you, would you help us to encourage one another uh, to the same end that we would abandon every other idol, abandon every other foundation, we build our life on you. Look to you first and above all things. That you'll be most weighty, most glorious in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts. And Father, we're also asking, would your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven? Would you, would you hasten this day? The day of the seventh trumpet? When everything evil, everything sad, everything wrathful, everything destructive is made untrue and you make all things new. And we get to be with you forever. Father, help us to be faithful witnesses. Help us to be clear in our call to repentance, but not, um, not unlovingly, not arrogantly, not contemptuously, but lovingly and winsomely and even at great cost to ourselves. We see after the death of the witnesses, some come to repentance. Father, we've seen that throughout history. Um, I'm not asking for our deaths, but Father, I'm asking that we would be willing at great cost to us, knowing that even if we do die, you hold us safely in your righteous right hand. And that we'd be so about your business in the world that we wouldn't even value our lives over your glory and seeing other people come to know you. Help us. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.